The following podcast is an Embassy Row production. Welcome to a new episode of the Shaken and Stirred Show. I'm Nigel Barker, and thanks, co-host Tom Astor, for giving me the oomph I needed to get this episode up and running. How are you, buddy? I'm very well, thanks, Nigel. I'm very well. Yeah, things are ticking over. You know, no. I'm off to South France. Oh, you are south of I... France. How fancy! Yeah, I know. It's not fancy. Well, I'm not going to go stay with a friend of mine, but. Yes, he's on his own down there, and he's sending me these very lonely pictures of these restaurants that are still open, getting the last bit of the summer. Um, I'm heading off on Sunday for three days, so I'm actually quite excited. I haven't been away for about two years, so it's time. It sounds like it's high time, and in south of France, what could be nicer than that? How amazing. By the way, I hope they have a barber down there or a hairdresser. I know, seriously, what's going on with the hair? Literally, normally. You, I... you have proper quarantine hair going on. I don't think I've seen you with a larger bouffant in a very long time. That's girl who used to cut my hair lived on the farm so I was the only one looking trim throughout pandemic quarantine lockdowns and everything because she used to come over and well we all live in the same place so it was allowed but um, she has left so you know I, I forgot that she's left she'd just normally turn up every couple of weeks and just cut my hair and wouldn't even think about it but I've suddenly realized that having to look at myself on screen now it's getting a little out of control but anyway it looks good though it looks great it, it's quite amazing just how it continues to grow up it's sort of straight up it doesn't no, go right. down it just carries on going up and up well and it's also quite lustrous you might say for all those people listening out there yeah, so guys, you know, you can have to check us out on a, we're actually on YouTube, so you can actually watch this podcast if you really want to, too. And you can actually have a look at uh, the snapper's hair because it's actually worth looking at. And I'll have to post a picture of it, I think, on social media. So check it out there as well, because it's definitely worth the look. It's, it's quite I, something. You know my secret. The secret, Tom's secret. Here is a, and you know what, your secret, by the way, you've passed down to your godson, who is my child, Jack who now does exactly what you've done and has not washed his hair using shampoo in, I think, a year and a half, maybe two hair. years now. I bet his hair looks damn good. It looks very good. He, he's, he says, just like you do. And it doesn't smell bad, by the way. You'd think, you, guys, it would smell always, bad. You wash it, you rinse it two or three times a week in a shower. You rinse it with, with water and it gets natural oils back and then it looks after itself after that. And it doesn't smell bad. Rinse it two or three times, you know, have a shower, you know, get wet two or three times a week but other than that um no products i tell you that's that shit makes your hair fall out which is there why i'm not suffering from that problem at the moment meanwhile i'm washing my hair every day Oop. yeah Oops. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> washed it washed it out literally <laughs> clearly washed out what are you drinking tommy boy well something rather unusual tonight my daughter came by and gave me something she said you're doing a podcast tonight so i'm going to give you uh a cocktail in a bottle now it comes the bottle can you see that it says yeah, first aid box okay which first is not a box it's a bottle so whoever did this is probably pissed it's a granny smith gimlet it comes ready made a granny smith gimlet chapel down gin chapel down bacchus 30 to 40 whatever that means to me ferdinand's verju apple shrub and apple sherbet i have no idea what any of that means um basically it's a fresh super vibrant martini fresh grassy and juicy um so it basically just says shake well straight into a martini and drink so <laughs> does it have alcohol in it already then you don't add it to well, I, I fucking hope so yes 22 percent. so in it goes look at that silver it, goblet no less first aid um the old first aid kit one of my favorite bands but anyway uh give it a bit of shake no i have mixed cocktail well i'm not really mixing them i'm teasing but i have oh power change the sound of the ice It sounds like it's gone all together. Sounds like it's He's shaking gone. on on air, people, right now. Anyway, into the glass it goes. Um, so while I'm pouring this out, what are you drinking? I am drinking once again. Guess the guest. 
I have decided to go for it. I looked it up. I looked up Broadway themed cocktails, people, and I came up with one called Spent the Rent, which is uh, apparently, you know, dreamt up by the Broadway musical Rent. Hint, hint, say no more. One ounce of gin, quarter of an ounce of lemon juice, and one and a half ounces of champagne. So, um, that, no wonder that's how you spend the rent right there, is by adding all that champagne. But cheers, my friend. Hi. And the name of my cocktail has got nothing to do with, I guess, Granny Smith. Let's hope not. <laughs> cheers. Cheers, cheers, cheers. Mm, it's delicious, actually. I'm surprised that it really went as pale as it did, but that's really very, very, very good. So, okay, people, on to, before we get to our guest, a little bit of booze news. Um, in the world of booze news, there's nothing like a Guinness World Record, in my opinion. And a man in England has decided to um, get the world record on the largest, longest pub crawl. Now, apparently, there wasn't actually a Guinness World Record already set. This is the first of its kind. So, uh, I mean, I guess that's what, one of the things you could do if you ever want to get a world record is just look for one that isn't there versus beating one, because then you can just set whatever the standard is and it may not be very good. But he did 51 bars in 24 hours. This guy is Matt Ellis, um, and he's from Cambridgeshire. And he went to 51 bars in 24 hours, and at every bar he had to have a drink. So can you imagine just how he must have felt halfway through the night at, what, at some point and at what and how do you even do that i mean it's it's quite it's ridiculous he apparently went to 10 different pubs within the first hour um and and what he's what he had to do was drink up to 125 milliliters of any drink which is about like a shot so you have to do basically a shot at every place you go to um uh, which, by the way, I don't recommend trying to beat this record. I think it sounds quite dangerous. I think you could be kind of paralytic um, halfway through. I'm sure he probably drunk. It wasn't all alcohol. It can't have been. It, must have, it would have probably killed him. But um, anyway, there we have it. Booze news. What do you think of that, Tom? So that's, that's the basic what, it's two pubs, isn't it? Two bars every hour. Right. I when... guess it's doable when you say it like that. It's doable. You've got to be in a city. Where did, where, which, where was he when he did this? I guess he, he started his epic night out, started in Cambridge, England, and he visited 10 pubs within the first hour. And um, he just went, and he, I guess it was probably local around that area. I mean, you know, how many pubs are there in Cambridge? Well, they're not that many. That's the thing. That's why I'm amazed. Yeah. Good thing. I think that's a, a, a fine record to set, and I think it needs to be beaten tonight. But now that you've said it, that's only two bars an hour. The problem he had it was he was in Cambridge. Imagine if you're in New York and there's like 51 bars on your, you know, just in your area, local area. I mean, you but could probably hit like, I don't know, we could I don't know, multiply that number by many. We'll have we to do. break this one, Tom. You we and me. Do it. We, do we should it. do this. Let's do People, it. Let's we have a challenge. We need, I love, you're both like Guinness and, um, and we like a record. So I think we should, there's our challenge. I'm so not drinking I'm... a Guinness in every bloody place we go to. I'm telling you that. No, Guinness Book of... Guinness World Record. I Rec know, I know. Oh, my God. God. We have a Broadway star as a guest. I'm being dramatic. Is she here? Our guest today is a good friend and a grand dame of Broadway, well known for her role in Rent and this year for her role in Lin-Manuel Miranda's smash hit In the Heights. Please welcome Daphne Rubin Vega. Daphne, how are you, my love? I'm very well, thank you. How are you, Nigel? Hi, Tom. Hi, there, Daphne. Hello. You look amazing. You sound amazing. I, I, you just showed me your glass, which is the same <laughs> size as your head, and it, it, it really is slightly terrifying. But um, I think it's all camera angles. What are you drinking? I think you, you look like some sort of fizzy cock cocktail. The red stuff. This is Coke. Coke, Straight up, people. Coke, red Coke, okay? Not messing around. She's going straight no. for the hard stuff. Coke. No, man, I don't we don't do Coke on, on the, the Shaken coke. and Stirred show. This is this is a cocktail oh. show, not drugs. Okay, Daphne. You know what? You can do whatever you do. I'm going to do this Coke right here in this King's you Goblet. Do you, boo. I got okay. You. But I also have choices because today I have choices. I have my Cafe Bustelo mug, which is actually my favorite mug in the whole wide world because it's bright yellow. But I have apple cider in it because, you know, it's October. So apple cider, you know, in the UK, when we say cider, cider is alcoholic. 
Yeah, I know. I have had snake bites and you know, I don't know, those red-eyed snake bites. What do you call them when you when you stick snake, like yeah, a snake bite, which is when you put we put cider and bit as a beer and a bit of snake bite in black, you put a bit of black currant in it. That's we it. Also, we also have apple cider vinegar, which is very good for your health. Ooh. Yeah, yeah which I put your <laughs> Call it to assist bread. the liver you're destroying right 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 so just like give it a little like kiss kiss it while you're you know there we go. Yeah. Nice. said well right there she was, it was already assuming that we've destroyed our livers you know, i did not assume you, that was a complete you know. assumption by the way but in the in the meantime cheers daphne welcome cheers, to the shake salute. oh what are you drinking i have gone all the way out i went and looked up broadway themed cocktails and found one called spent the rent which is gin lemon juice and champagne just for you oh wow. yeah I, I feel so special you and drink you, tom <laughs> Tom has just gone and bought something in a bottle called First Aid, which I have no idea First what that is. First Aid box. Which is well, not even a box, is it? That's pretty good, right? Well, you'll appreciate, I did, um, I did a musical um, based on the, um, the House of Bernarda Alba, which is not joyful at all, by Garcia Lorca. It was called Bernarda Alba, but my character's name was Martirio, which is martyrdom. And, you know, she was the quintessential martyr, um, <clears throat> you know, this misshapen, disfigured, angry, bitter character. So afterward, we would have these drinks named after the sisters because we all had these like dire names. So of course my drink was the dirty Martirio. Anyway, but- uh, but No, I love that. And what, but what was in it? A lot of olives and a lot of um, of olive juice. Oof, a lot of olive yeah. juice. That sounds kind olive of... Olive juice. It was not olive oil, olive juice. That's like... The... Yeah, no, olive oil would have probably... <laughs> that would have probably been, I don't know, at least a little bit of it. Yeah, yeah, the <laughs> that filthy juice going down a little better. Wow. <laughs> So listen, I, we don't normally talk about the pandemic on this thing. We, we, get, we really get away from it, but your industry has been hit particularly hard, theater industry, particularly hard by, by quarantine and pandemic. And I know I have several friends who are in the theater industry who obviously were about to do shows who just, the whole show got scuttled and that was it. How, how have you been and how, how have you coped? Well, as a Tony voter, it was like just everything was interrupted. So, um, so we definitely felt, I felt as a, as a member of the community, I felt the, just the absolute, like, um, you know, stroke as it were. Um, and, um, and, and interruption, I mean, but personally, you know, I had the resources to go upstate, chill upstate, not far from you. Um, work on the film, work on a lot of stuff on Zoom. Suddenly the Zoom theater world, which is a whole other, um, you know, conundrum, right? You have to set up your own things, things that you weren't allowed to touch in the past um, suddenly become your responsibility to set up and, and take down, like to mic yourself, light yourself, shoot yourself, do stuff, you know. So what do the unions have to say about that, for God's sakes? Because normally it's like, can I touch that <laughs> light bulb? No, that's a union job. Can I do right, no, right, that? Right. So now that's you're really like, like question. you said. That's a really good question because, um, you know, unions have nothing to do with the pandemic and what you do and don't do um, as far as an artist goes. You know, artists will still art, right? So as far as IATSE, and you can see, um, you know, you can see how the unions are either supporting or des devastatingly le letting people down, like right now as we speak, like, you know, the messiness is coming to order now. And there's a lot of writers being written and changes being made and um, interruptions being had on account of that very thing, you know? Do you think, do you think there's going to be a Broadway um, show about the pandemic, about quarantine? You know, anything is possible and sure, why not? I think that it's part of our truth now, a pandemic um, experience. 
and to pretend that it's not happening or that like, okay, it's over, are we good? You know, is, um, it's unwise. A, a, a Broadway show, a Broadway show is exhausting. It costs a lot of money. Speaking of the pandemic, we're all in the same small space and a little, you know, family um, for like three months, six months, nine months, depending on the success or failure of the show. And there's a lot of people putting a lot of coins in it and like, do you really want to see that? And who's going to see that? Who's going to see that, you know, when there's Wicked and something else, right? So, um, But you've done so a lot of, you've done a lot of, of one man, one woman shows, if you like. And, and I, I've, I know that, you know, I remember the one, I forget the name of it all of a sudden, but it was sort of Sweeney Todd and some crazy- Empanada Loca. There you go. I remember Which that Which is one. turning that into, um, well, yeah, yeah, go on. That's is it, well, anyway, I was going to say that, that that sort of speaks to me of like, you know, you're, if you're able to do like a, a one woman show like that, you know, and it's it, about sort of this sort of a character, Sweeney Todd, but it's from your perspective about a woman in, you know, in, in sort of below ground. That, that just speaks to me of, you know, the, the loneliness of being quarantined. There's a whole show into that where, you know, you, you don't have to have other people around you and it sort of, but makes people feel it and see it and sense it in another way. And Arc, arc oh. like you mentioned it can be healing too you know it's good to laugh it's good to recognize the tragedy it's good to see things and be like okay whew, yeah like we can do this because otherwise it's if you live in fear if you know it's, you know i think this, similarly with <coughs> someone like the president or whatever like that you know if you're if you're scared of a president or you're scared of something that happened that's very damaging but this sort of cathartic element to be to what art can bring to a situation where it can bring levity right well, here's the thing, with this experience we're having, like I'm looking at you on this little grid of squares, right? And even Anna Marie, who, who, who I don't see, is here, right? And then like there could be like a whole other, and there's, there's a complicated component, but we don't need theater. <laughs> we don't need, right, that we can get our, our jollies off different ways um, what theater does do is have have I I impose a collective experience, right? They, you know, theater concerts, uh, collective experiences, um, which in these days um, you either want to have, but you want to have it sort of exclusively. You don't want everybody around. You don't trust everybody, you know. So. It's interesting, maybe there is a world where these, because um, I know that there are little enclaves where like some really incredible theater is happening. Incredible theater, you know? And like necessity is the mother of invention. And there is something about pain being a huge touchstone for inspiration. You know, Sting like didn't write because he was happy. You know, he wrote his best songs because his wife was gonna you know, <laughs> and you know, Marvin Gaye, like, you know, I mean, the blues, right? So we're never gonna stop making art. We're going to either listen to, um, you know, the, um, the, the big companies that, that sell it and like sort of modify and transform and sometimes deform quite often the art um, or, <laughs> we're gonna go off like underground like in Panada Loca you know and like have some sort of subversive theater which it, I mean it just seems sort of I'm, and I'm totally tripping with the idea but just you know you can't talk about art without talking about politics you can't talk about theater without talking about you know the state of the world right. and um, you know and you know how people want to make money you mentioned you just mentioned Sting, didn't you? The performer. Yeah, did. Now, didn't you didn't you choose a police song, Roxanne, as your audition song for I Rent? I sure did. I uh, sure did. Oh my god! And I just kept singing Roxanne, like just because I belted it over and over and over. He was like, "All right, let's bring her back." <laughs> <laughs> and, and then they gave you another song to sing. But I, I was just wondering, like, when I, when I, as, as a choice of song, Roxanne, is that, you know, obviously the, the, those lyrics very specific, right? Uh, you know, and I, I always 
sort of laugh when I hear that song. I can't. I always have Eddie Murphy in my head singing it in <laughs> Beverly Hills Cop. You know, and he's right. in the jail, and he's sort of he's there yes, singing it in yes. the highest in his funny little high pitched voice, and then yes. I imagined you singing it for your audition, and it's it's one of those. Did you pick it because of the because of of, of what you were going why. for? I picked it because musical theater was not. I, it was not my wheelhouse, so I didn't have, and they did not want musical theater, so that was to my advantage. Rock and roll was my wheelhouse, and I thought nobody up in here is going to sing Roxanne, right? And um, and I could I could sing to Roxanne, and I could be Roxanne, mm -hmm. you know, and um, and it, it you know it'd been off of after a run of a lot of like, yeah, that was nice, thank you, no, thank you, no. Um, you know, lots of like not even looking up or yawning, you know, you know, just like auditioning, you know how it is. Mm. Um, and I thought, I'm gonna leave this room and they're gonna, then they might not like it, but they're gonna see what I can do, what I can do. You know, it was one of those moments where it's like, I'm gonna give what I can give and, you know, forget trying to, um, be good or be like someone else that's fabulous. Um, I had fallen flat on my face trying to be like other people. Um, and that's how I learned Mimi. Mimi was not trying to be uh, like anyone else. Mimi was like soul, I think. Um, Mimi was kind of the me that um, wanted to be unapologetic. You know, they knew that you were going to cross the street if you saw me. <laughs> um, and it was ironic because it was Mimi who had people saying, oh, I just like to take her home and feed her, you know, um, like it, it, it really turned on me. Um, but yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's such a sort of, you know, you talk about being authentic and, and doing something that is you ultimately. You know, obviously, when you're performing, you're acting, you're often playing, you're playing another character. But in order to get there, you often have to be your most authentic self in order to find that other character too, right? In order to be honest or true to that other character. Well, here's something that I've found a lot, the older I've gotten, because I've turned around in post pandemic, it's like, oh, my God, I'm a, I'm a fucking elder. I'm an elder now. Do you know, That's like in this community? Wow. And, um, and, you know, there was a phase where, I mean, I did go to um, university. I, I did have training in filmmaking, but not my, my drama training was outside and, and the world was my drama teacher more than um, Juilliard. But then I didn't, hmm, it's like, I heard about, these actors around me doing all this difficult research to research a role. And it was admirable and it was so, wow. And it was like, I live this role. Like I know these people. It's mm -hmm. not like I was a junkie stripper with AIDS, but I am in proximity to these lives that have been touched by trauma for last lack of a better word by specific experiences i know that world and so it's um it, it's it's a privilege as an as an actor to be able to um embody those roles realistically because you're telling the truth did you go into that to the audition for rent knowing that that's the part you were gonna you wanted to go for did that 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 sort of came your way after the fact did you audition for a very specific role or was it just the whole no, I auditioned for, for Mimi and um, and I was like, you know, Mimi lives on the Lower yeah. East Side. So I was like, oh, I know Mimi. You know, I am Mimi. I right. had worked at, you know, <laughs> I worked at Patricia Fields. So it was like Mimi was in my closet. Mimi was in my back pocket. Mimi was, you know, just like, go like this, right? So um, Patricia Field, Tom, uh, is a, was a store, is a store. I'm not sure if she has, still has it or not, but it's basically, does she still have it? This Patricia's... It's online now, yes. It's, it's online it's, now. It's gallery, but, yeah. But, it, but it, it was a very, very kind of cool, funky shop that, you know, was, had a, it was one of the sort of first, you know, 
real LGBTQ plus kind of um, shops that serve people in that community and all communities, to be honest, I, anyone who was a party person, you know, club um, kid, anyone would probably go there and shop there. And Ivy, a friend of yours, Tom and mine, used to work there as well. So really? I, Ivy, yeah, I used to work there. She was um, someone who I photographed a few different times. But before really? we get there, even your, your career, you talked about music, you talked about singing. You were, a, you are a musician, you are a singer, right? You used to, you, you released an album, <laughs> didn't you? Or something like, or you almost did, or you were I on that? I released some albums of my, of my own. Right. Um, I've recorded a few albums, um, you know, in addition to, you know, um, soundtrack albums. No, I've, I've recorded, and produced actually um, my own stuff, my own work. Um, yeah. Is that why you didn't like? Is that why you not? not I don't know now things are different, but back in the day, why musical theatre perhaps was like you were like eh, because you were kind yeah. of more serious musician. You're more. Well, you know, you know, I wasn't more serious. I just really believed um, that acting was a certain kind of skill and singing was another, and that <clears throat> there was something more prestigious about keeping them separate. There was something that didn't speak to me um, in regards to the musical theater that was, you know, uh, amplified at the time. You know, there were exceptions. Like I really did grow up listening to Jesus Christ Superstar. And Tommy was a legit rock opera mm. that I could totally listen to. But, you know, Tommy, the musical on Broadway was not something we could even afford to go see. So by then it was just like, I was one of those kids that was like, oh, musical theater, you know, it's not like, I don't want to be any, you know. Um, I got, you know, I have my microphone and two turns, you know, it's like, I'm going to do my own thing. Yeah, look where that got me. Well, I mean, you know, life's full of, life's full of, uh, you know, chapters and ups and downs and things you try and, <laughs> You know, you probably wouldn't have been where you were today if you weren't, if you didn't, you hadn't tried all of that as well, right? So, well, it's... you know, here's where like the corny shout out to Jonathan Larson um, comes up and Tick Tick Boom is coming out next month on my birthday. So, Amazing. Um, but, uh, and Andrew Garfield looks exactly like Jonathan Larson, but Jonathan, he was like, oh yeah, no, I get it. I, I, I get you. Um, it's weird, but he was such um, a, a, a nerd and, and, and like such an ologist when it came to Stephen Sondheim and putting, um, you know, making a storyline progress through song and, and relationships and stuff that was like another, another level. So I had to like <laughs> listen to him because he knew how to structure and write a good song. So I was like, oh, I kind of like this guy. You know, he, he has skills. Um, so yeah, he made me, and, and I thought, I don't like musical theater, but at the time this musical was about, you know, my, my people, right? Um, I mean, yeah. and that, that's something that's very close to your heart, obviously, is, 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 you know, highlighting, you know, your community, your people, where you're from, your, your life. And, you're, and, you know, speaking of that, I mean, you are- Neighborhood. Right, your neighborhood and what have you, but you know, to, I guess talk to us a little bit about what that means, because grow, what, what was your life growing up like? I mean, I know that you were sort of born, I believe, in Panama, but you were only there for a couple of years, right, until you came to the, the States. So tell, talk to us, take us back a little bit and give us a little bit of, you know, childhood Daphne. I was born, how does it go? Um, I am three, I am free, going to a new country for the first time. I'm flying, I'm flying Panam. I was born in Panama, I am a Vega, la 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 la. You can see it in my feet, hey! My father comes from the tiny town of Los Santos, boom, 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 boom. It's almost half a day away from the city of Panama. Mm -mm. And if it weren't for the sun, his skin would be white as milk. Campesinos de los Santos, peasants of the saints. And the music goes on. My mother's skin is as dark as my father's skin is light. And she was born in the city of Panama, like me. Same hospital, actually. Her parents came from Barbados to build the Panama Canal. Panama is where I learned to walk. Panama is where I learned to talk. 
but I will only return for brief hellos and long goodbyes and the casting of ashes. So that's wow. a little bit. <laughs> Wait, what the hell? Who has that? Normally I ask someone what happened, what was their childhood like? They don't have a full <laughs> scripted song to go along with it. That yeah. is brilliant. That was, <laughs> that's a first right there. I love that. My goodness, how brilliant. You're the first that's gotten that, Nigel. I can't believe that just came out of my face, but I had to share it. Yeah. That was amazing. We love that. That was really, really cool. So, but I mean, I okay. The so, wrong key. So, that was, so, look, you, so you, there you are, this young little girl from Panama. You're, but you, you what? You moved to New York or you moved where? Actually, I moved to Washington, D.C. DC. Um, at first, because my uncle, um, yeah, you know, it, um, yeah, no, I moved to Washington, D.C. with my aunt and uncle. Um, and, you know, in those days, you come alone, right? I, I, I remember having a conversation with the moms, actually, and them saying, how could anyone put a child on an airplane by themselves? Like, what is that? And it's like, oh, yeah, no, that, that was my life. You know, like, it's necessity is what it is. Um, and um, so... So yeah, you know, I guess my parents broke up and my mom was like, I'm gonna get a life and, um, and I'm gonna take the kids and she's gonna go to the US where she can get a better life. You know, that narrative of like, but where was my mom? You know, it's like, no, oh, she's going to the United States to, you know, have an uncle that's a diplomat and go to, you know, Catholic schools and do that thing. And, be educated the way um, so she could, you know, be me, right? So, so there is a writing process of like, wow, um, you know, to be my age, which is older than my mother ever was, ever was, and um, and know that like my life and uh, is is really the direct result of choices that she made as an immigrant, you know. No, your mother passed away when you were a young girl, right? Yeah. Yeah, she died of cancer. Did that have a very, that obviously cancer. must have had a very difficult, um, obviously a hard, must be very hard on you and probably probably may, may well be still is. But I mean, is that, how was that after that, being a, a young girl growing up in a country, which I don't know, did you call it home? Was it home home at that point? You were so young when you came over, I imagine it was. But it seems like it was a lot of transience in, this, in your life at that point. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I was one of those kids where a lot of shit happened, you know, a lot of stuff happened and um, on paper, it looks like, you know, I, I kind of um, am amused watching, <laughs> watching people's faces absorb that the stories, you know, um, and I, I kind of like, but yeah, that happened to me and, um, you know, I've learned it's not really what happens. I mean, yeah, things happen but it's what what we do, our characters or our spirits kind of do to recycle that stuff, you know? And it doesn't matter. Um, I mean, to a degree, it matters like the quality of trauma, but, you know, if you're constantly wanting to be heard in any level or echelon and you're not heard, um, that's just, um, it wears on you and it, it, it can really affect you, right? So I don't know. I think that um, it allowed me to shape shift a lot, mm. right? It allowed me to, to shape shift. Um, it, it gave me the, the tools to, um, to know how to embody emotions that were sort of difficult, that seemed evolved, but they were really just extreme pain and extreme joy, right? Um, and, um, and also the tools to, I don't know, I think it's just something that I liked, something that I like to do. Often I mean, I've had many directors make fun of me and like, yeah, Daph, your life was so effed up. Of course you want to be an actor. And it's like, yeah, you know, you too. But yeah, you know, maybe, maybe not, right? Well-balanced people don't want to be actors, Daph. It's too much. It's like, okay. 
Well, you're, you've got you. So you're sort of, you know, you're full of, I guess, multitudes in a way. You're, you've got a lot of different sort of parts to you. You know, you can be. You understand the passion. You understand the pain. You know, you you understand the hurt. You it wasn't all easy, but you've also been lucky. You know, there've been a lot of different things. So that there's elements where that multi-dimensional kind of background helps you pull from various different experiences to be able to actually, you know, be the wonderful actress that you are. And you know, it's. Yeah, I know that you've obviously when, you, when it comes to picking a role for yourself, what do you look for? What is it that you're like, OK, this is for me? Or do you see things that you're like, eh, I like the idea, but I'm not going to do it. What, how, what is what is your process? Well, you know, saying I like the idea, but I'm not going to do it has been a privilege that I've only recently mm. kind of stepped on. Right. And even so, like, you know, the things you want are always like, ah, just a little, you know, beyond, you know, there's like, right. So the, the, you know, the aim is far, um, but, you know, coming back to the pandemic, I think my, just my priorities have shifted the stories that I want to tell. Um, they're not that far away. So so my own story whereas you know 10 years ago it was like i have to be in it i have to star in it i have right. to you know like like be the judge and the jury too today it's like damn i have learned that like certain aspects of theater and film and creating stories is extremely collaborative so, you know, the part that I can do is tell, you know, write the story and then see where it goes from there. So that's a process that I'm doing. But I'm not going to lie to you. I don't know if you guys, I mean, do you write? Y'all write? Y'all write? Do you write, Tom? You said well, you would write. Write that song occasionally, yeah. yeah. You do? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I play, well, I mean, I play, I'm a musician, so I play a lot, which is, which is, a, which so I'm constantly making things up. Yeah. So which I suppose is writing, isn't it? But um, yeah, so yes, yeah. that's your question. Yeah, um, I find for me sometimes it's, it's excruciating, but <clears throat> worth it. The actual writing process you find excruciating? So, uh, yeah, like um, sort of like digging my heels and then suddenly, you know, the, the urge comes, it's like, it's like, you know, wanting to, pardon the expression, like just go to the bathroom. It's like, oh, I have to go now. <laughs> it's like, you can't like, you know, I mean, you can hold it in, but then it'll pass. And you'll be like, what was that? I thought it was brilliant. And it's like, yeah, well, it's gone. So yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah, yeah I've heard other, to... other people talk about purging or, you know, like, so you're like, you're saying like, kind of yeah, if I don't, when you get it out yeah if i don't do it poop this now it's it's not gonna go it's not it's hap it's just gonna <laughs> and trust me when she writes it's even more eloquent than the way she speaks right so <laughs> i'm trying to like hold it back but like this is a podcast and see that's the thing like why are we what are we holding back you know what do you hold back i mean do you do you hold back it seems to me i mean ever since since i've ever first met you you're one of those people who you can't forget first of all you're you've got i'm gonna say that's a good thing okay uh, of course it's a great thing it's well, the same with you nigel it's the best thing well thank you very much but i mean you know this is i only invite guests on who is a mutual aberration society first of all but you know but mutual ultimately... aberration you say <laughs> <laughs> but you are someone who is this, you know, you've got a, a lot of energy, but you've also, you know, you, you, you feel, I feel like you're in touch, that your feet are on the ground at the same time as it's you're sort of explosive. So that's an unusual combination to be able to be like everywhere, but centered. It, it, that, the sort of those things don't tend to go together. People are often everywhere and therefore like all over the place or they're completely centered and can be dull. But there's an element of having both, which is unusual. And I, it's, you're someone who has that. And I find actually my wife, Chrissy, has a lot of that too. Like she's she's very big. She's over the top. She's yes. kind of funny. She's silly, giggly, girly. But she's also grounded, grounded person and yeah. caring and kind and, you know, and is not like a sort of overly affected by, say, success or or fame or things that happen and you know working in your industry there's a lot of crazy you know and a lot of people very affected um 
you know, mm-hmm. how do you stay that way? I mean, I know you've got your marriage, you've got kids, your family. I mean, there's, you know, what is that a big, big part of it for you? Or what, what, what is your? I'm, I make it a priority because I know that, um, I know that I can, it, it, I don't like being out of my right. center, do you know? Um, I think it's, it's a hard learned thing. <laughs> um, I certainly am human. Um, I, I think sometimes I need a lot of sleep. I need to, um, and I also have a coterie of friends that I can really just lean back and be totally me. Do you know? I really can just, um, I'm, I'm lucky to, to have that. My, my mental problem though, my challenge is that sometimes I, um, I love to just shut myself off and I don't realize that I'm doing that, you know? Yeah, I think that just knowing that has been so helpful. I think knowing that has been helpful. So, yeah. Because um, why, can... why is shutting yourself off problematic? I mean, shutting yourself off sometimes, I, I know personally, I find that it's essential. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree. I think it can be problematic for me because um, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not the best judge at all times. I like, I will, um, pardon the expression, but I love it. Like invaginate, you know that word. I you don't. Never heard that word. No. What is that word? Oh invaginate. God, it's such a yummy word. Well, pardon. <laughs> it's actually um, like, like uh, when you go inside, like when. Um, yeah, it, it's it's to it's to implode like physically, like um, there's certain it's a medical term that when someone is morbidly obese, like they're they invaginate. You know what I'm saying? Wow. It's like the opposite of a prolapse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, 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 okay. prolapse. Yes, okay. I, I will prolapse exactly. I like it that way better. It's got a V in it. <laughs> I can learn something every day. You learn so, something every day on the Shaken and Stirred show, especially if you make Daphne on. You're welcome, people. You're welcome. Invagination sounds way more appealing than prolapsing. You've been using your invagination for years, Tom. What do you think? <laughs> it was just my imagination. Five questions. Imaginate or prolapse. <laughs> we'll have to put it in our multi-choice questions moving swiftly online oh my god i think that's a wonderful wonderful uh um, conundrum to, to raise <laughs> you talked about you talked about mental health a second ago and you know obviously that's a big thing for a lot of people regardless of what's going on in the world but certainly you know, in the acting community, there's a lot of people. I'm a mental health denier. Are you? Are you someone? Are you a denier? I, I deny mental health completely. Um, no, of course, I'm being absolutely facetious. Um, and I cut you off. I'm sorry. No, no. But that, I mean, this is all a part of it. I mean, it's one of those subjects which is sort of hard for a lot of people to even talk, the whole the world to talk about on many levels. And, uh, you know, there's there's we're all kind of dealing with it on some level i mean right now i'd much rather be us all together in a room having a you know a chat which is which is you know where we're moving towards but certainly you know for for, for a long time we haven't been able to do that and i think that has a large effect on people but you know the actors in the acting world and the theatrical world and the art world you have a lot of people who are suffering from various forms of of you know mental health issues um, and and, so, and, it can, and acting in itself can be a, way, a form of therapy, right? It's sort of, it, 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 people find themselves and they can- they Not can a replacement, but yes, yes, yeah. it can be therapeutic. I, I don't know, I would wager that it's not that there's more actors, you know, um, dealing with mental health issues than others. Um, I would just say that <laughs> they're more dramatic about it and out on it, you know, like oh, I have mental health issues. Maybe, maybe some are invaginating more than others. I mean, maybe the other ones 
need to get their shit together and start invaginating. Like, yeah, I know. <laughs> on a daily basis. Tom, I'm not sure you can just use the word invaginate in everything you're doing, by the way. It's not, yes, it's not, he can. He's going to be invaginating his tea in the morning and invaginating his toast and everything. It's like, what the hell? It can, I, it's just, it's opened up a whole new world. Of, <laughs> no. like, possibility. It's opened when, up a whole new thank world. Thank you very much. You've taught me something, a, a new word that I intend to use a lot because nobody in this country would have heard of it yet. But I tell you, it'll be, it'll be, it will be spoken at everyone's breakfast tables before you can say prolapse. Imaginate. <laughs> well, imaginate, exactly. There we go. Uh, wow, wow. There we go. That's coming speak. from a man who doesn't speak at breakfast, by the way. If you ever go to Tom's house and you sit there at breakfast, it's like silence is golden. And if you dare say anything, everyone looks at you very quickly and upset. Like, oh, he spoke. Silence. I'm thoroughly was, enjoying this change, though. It was, it was your, Nigel once stayed with me with his wife. He was, he was saying before, it's quite, it's quite uh, a gregarious, it's quite sort of outgoing and quite, it can be quite noisy, I suppose. And my father, my father at breakfast likes, but it likes to kind of gather his thoughts before the day starts. Anyway, she came down to breakfast and she started having chatting away like nobody's business. And I think, Dad, my father... Are you talking about Chrissy? He, Chrissy, and he put his newspaper down. He said, how on earth can you have so much to talk about? Nothing's happened yet today. And, <laughs> and, that was a, and she, would, she decided that that wasn't the case at all. Huge amounts have happened in, in her head or somewhere or whatever in her imagination. And then proceeded just to carry on anyway. And his paper just went back up. And they just, I suppose, agreed to kind of, you know, be themselves. But there we go. There should have been more imagination going on there, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just yeah. Imaginating. You need to imaginate your dad's yeah. tea. <laughs> And speaking of invaginated tea, I think absurdity is a really viable tool for mental health these days. And well, I say why, that because... Thank like, God you're on our podcast. With that's absurdity. It should be the absurdity and shaking an absurdity show. Yes, and I think that that's, this is part of the healing process. So growing up in the 70s when... Um, you know, I noticed that the, the, the colors, just like now, like the colors are, are like puce and mauve and pewter and gray and kind of drabs, right? And, and Monty Python was such a bomb, you know? I mean, there, there was Benny Hill, but that was kind of like, eh, eh. It was a little too slapstick for me, but Monty Python was absurd and hilarious. And I didn't know why, but now that um, I'm an elder, I, it, it's like absurdity. There's a, there's, a, there's a space for it because shit is not making sense these days. You know, who's running the world and, and by what criteria, right? Um, well, the world is absurd, right? So absurdity is one of those things where it, it, it's sort of, it, it's funny because it, things, when something's absurd, it can both be bad, ridiculous, sort of poor. Infuriating. In, in, infuriating, but also hilarious. And, you know, and, and, and sort of absurd humor in itself is sort of calling to, you know, to people's attention how somehow kind of how, how ridiculous in a way something is right but that in itself is is you know can be very funny when something is completely ridiculous or it can be and that's where this sort of fine line of tragedy or comedy <laughs> lies it's sort of you know if something is completely absurd you can either cry about it or laugh about it so you've got an option but it but it's uh, but it's or you can cry so much that you start or laugh so much that you start crying right or you know, it's, or it's, it's terribly it's, frustrating but, but, it's like but it's like no, what's interesting is you say well the world is absurd and i was about to sort of tick you off a bit and say well hang on a minute we'll take something seriously like nature and i was going to go a bit eco and green on you but i also surreptitiously googled the definition of absurd and the de definition is wildly unreasonable illogical or inappropriate which sums up just about every flipping Thank nation you. government right idiot charge you know that we have you know so it's absolutely it does it does sum up the human the human 
condition at the moment is absurd. Yes. The so, theater of the absurd is before our very eyes. And and we're not even like trying to act like it's not. And 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 our privilege has got us like not really giving a Mary or acting like it'll just somehow get corrected, but my agency. I mean, how, where do I throw money at this, right? Yeah. As opposed to. Well, we had it. We've done. We had a podcast once with someone called Dr. Emily, and we were discussing the, the lost art. Right? We we might invigorate, invaginate, invigorate to invaginate. Let's invigorate, invaginate. Thing. With with Dr. Emily, who's a, a top sex doctor. Um, who we had on as a guest and yes this is something which we should we should next time we have an ex, a sex doctor on which i think we have one coming up by the way tom uh, another one because we're all of a sudden very fond of sex wow. doctors on the shaken and stirred show we also like saying things like invaginate fingering and things like that we like to, we like saying those words that you're not really allowed to say slightly schoolboy the whole thing but we like to do it in a serious context with professionals present so that every so often i i knew a director who would who would just sit there and ruminate and say, you know, it's not the P that bothers me. It's the niece. And he'd just leave it there. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what would you do with that, people? Mm. <laughs> Just say it sort of like out of nowhere for no reason at all and see <laughs> how it works. <laughs> it's not the P, people. It's the NIS. You know, it's not the P that bothers me. It's the niece. And you have to say niece. <laughs> niece. niece. It's a lot. Yes, there it is. <laughs> we are the knights that say NIS. <laughs> See, now wasn't that brilliant? See, that lives on. Monty Python, people. Yeah. We, so are we going to do a Monty Python on Broadway with you, Daphne? Is that going to happen? And if, is no. there, if, and if um, there was, which would be your favorite Broadway to be, to be or favorite Monty Python to turn into a Broadway production? Oh, my God. Uh, Life of Brian? Yeah. It have to be Life of Brian. <laughs> I'm Brian, and so is my wife. <laughs> Always look on the bright side of life. Oh dear Lord, you are such a big giant god. You're huge, right? The huge. Thank you much. What was what was the one which is um I mean there's so many great moments from from you know Monty Pythons in general, but the life of Brian was just hilarious. I mean, in so many ways, they haven't. Have, they, they did do um, Monty Python on, on Broadway, though, didn't they? Well, Spam a lot was on right. Broadway. Spam a lot. Um, that was a which, specific one just for them, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm sorry I missed it. Um, <laughs> Are you? But yeah, yeah. Speaking of Spam a lot, I think. Uh, well, I'm not going to talk about it. But do you know Camelot? Of course. The musical. I know of. Yeah, no, I'm just wondering, like a revival of Camelot. Thoughts. Thoughts could be good. Mm. Could be interesting. Okay. okay. Uh, what do you think of Bridgerton? Is it okay if I say I have not watched it? You're one of a few people who have not watched Bridgerton, the number two most watched show on Netflix, Bridgerton, after Squid Games. Which, oh my you know, goodness. which knocked it off its perch. Yeah. But before that, Bridgerton was the number one. I mean, I just thought it was fascinating in many ways because obviously it was the sort of meant to be, you know, English aristocracy, but played through multiple different, <laughs> you know, ethnicities, um, you know, which was sort of, sort of fascinating. Does it work? I mean, it, clearly people watched it, you know? I mean, but it was interesting to watch. Does it work? Okay, so like I see the thing and it says number one. I've watched things that are number one on X, you know, platform and it's like, but that show sucked. Do you know what I mean? It almost feels like, oh, it's number one, I must see it. And it's like, well, that was disappointing. You know what I mean? Well, um, you know, Squid Games, if you're not sure if you've seen that, but- I, I, I have. 
Been so I've watched some of it. I mean, it's one of those things where it's like the worst performing for worst performance ever almost and it's like you, you watch it and it's sort of ridiculous drama of sort of comedic levels of you know overacting and, and in part i because, think it's the disconnect with the vo voice i right, think probably that, you know what i mean like there's a context probably that we're missing in his voice his real voice um i'd like to see what it looks like with subtitles just because you know, I don't know. Sometimes I think there's fucking context missing of anyone putting anything fucking interesting on television. I don't watch television, but God, if something really good, you know, that some that someone I you know admire says, you should probably watch. Oh, it's all it's really absurd. The whole thing, not nearly enough imagination and total. No. <laughs> I think Bridgerton they could do with a bit of imagination at breakfast. And I don't sleep. know, mate. If you watch Bridgerton, they're invaginating constantly on that show. Or oh, doing oh yeah, I bet. I don't know. But you've got to be. You also got to be quite careful, and not to be too. I'm going to get serious now. Not too narrow-minded about these things. Netflix is Netflix. I have a friend of mine who once announced that he was better known um, and more widely known and better known than George Clooney, and much to the much to the horror of the assorted women sitting at dinner, and there were only about six of us sitting there. And it was absolutely true, because when you took what he said into, you know, put it in the realm of reality, he, his show that he did was watched in 52 different countries and shown 400 times, you know, or, 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 or how many countries there are, and shown every week in, in 88 different languages in, in all these different countries all around the world. Whereas George Clooney, who's terribly famous to us and, you know, an, an icon, right. is actually only really known by English speaking audiences and people are in, you know, really, I mean, which is very, very narrow for markets, a bit like the Netflix thing. I suppose Squid Thing is a, is a Japanese thing, isn't it? Is it Japanese? Korean. Korean. Is it, is it, in, is it in Korean? So it's funny yes. you should say that. My daughter, who's 12, who well. loved Squid Games, right? Oh. And she said to me, she was like, Dad, OK, look, I know it's, I, I said to her, it's not very good. This is kind of crap. I can't watch it. And she said, like, you know what you need to do? It's so much better if you watch it in Korean. And I'm yes. Like, and I was like, what do you mean it's better in Korean? You don't yeah. speak Korean. How can it be better? And she's like, it's not no. 18, it. in this country, my, my son's 12. It, it is a big freaking no, no. Yeah, well, it's, it's a it's a Say again. It's, it, it, it's it, a big. It's, it's, no, yeah, it's a sort of X-rated because I guess there's a lot of violence in Squid Games. But it's a it, lot of violence. Yeah. But she she has no problem with violence. She doesn't like scary things like horror. But she's no, she's fine with violence. If anyone gets <laughs> their head blown off, she's just like, oh, that's what it looks like, um, you know. But with, if you were to be like spooky and, and sort of religious or something, or you know, poltergeist type <laughs> of thing, she would be absolutely terrified. But with some a simply gun to the head, it's fine. So you know, people get killed in Squid Games like left, right, and center. But she's like, you've got to watch it in Korean with English subtitles. It's yes. way better. It makes much more sense. And I was like, wow. So it's funny because you just said the same thing, Daphne. You yeah. said just that. So there you go, people. That's what, there's the secret to Squid Games is uh, it, watch it. Yeah, I think, I think it goes for like, you know, you have to do the extra work, but like, you know, to see Jules et Jim with like, you know, in, 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 like subtitles would be like, oh, uh, no, it's not Jules and Jim, you know, or 100%. 100%. Look, we've got a couple of things before we, 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 we got one more thing that we do before we leave. But before we get there, I just wanted to also get into what, what have you got coming up, Daphne? What are you working on right now? I just wrapped a film called All Is Well that I worked with. Um, with members of the Labyrinth Theater Company. We've known each other for, you know, decades from the right. early 90s. And I think, well, before the pandemic, um, Elizabeth Rodriguez, Ben Snyder, and Liza Colonzeas were like, let's, let's do a Mike Lee style film where we, we grab stories from our own lives and somehow use these relationships and create a whole other story about it, but grounded in characters that we once really knew that existed. And um, <clears throat> it was like, yeah, that's a great idea. You know, that's 19, 
uh, 19. It's like 2019, 2020, 20. And it's all of a sudden we get a green light and actually have a budget. So we just wrapped on that. And um, amazing. When will it come out? Um, that's a really good question. And I do not know the answer. I think that um, because it was made independently as opposed to, um, you know, with, we don't, we don't know. We're going to, we're going to cut it and then we're going to take it around and we're going to see how it goes. Right. So. Well, good luck. Good luck. Good luck with that. Thank Amazing. you. Amazing. Well, you've had an, a, quite a pretty impressive year within the Heights and everything else that you've had going on and which is, you know, such a success. It's, you've just got so many different things that you do now, especially. Before we let you go, we have something called Last Orders, which is a simple um, sort of rapid fire question moment where yeah. we kind of just dig a little deeper into, into Daphne. We're going to start off with, you know, in, in, in the movie of your life, Daphne, yes. who would you have play you? Oh, wow. Ugh. I mean, I joke and say Miss Piggy because I always thought <laughs> Miss Piggy would be wonderful. Um, but a human? It could be whatever you like. Actually, it's quite funny. You would be the very first person to have ever picked a, an answer that no, would have been No, Miss Piggy would definitely be me, yeah. She... And, but why would she be you? Because she has a sense of humor and she, um, she likes to lean into drama and... Um, and she's not she, Latin. and what? She's, she's not Latin. Well, um, we can we can have you know, Señorita Porquita. Then <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to get the Señorita Porquita. We'll have to make her. Um, uh, <laughs> wow! Yeah. There you go, Tom. Uh, señorita Porquita. Porquita. <laughs> That might, have Cochinita, to be your, that might have to be Cochina, your new nickname, Tom. Cochina, Cochina is a way of saying pig, but it's like dirty, you know. Yeah, she'd have to be Senorita Cochinita. Um, Cochinita, Cochinita. What you say? Cochinita. 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 Um, who would I want playing me? Mm, you know, that's that's a good. That's a good question right, right now so i'm gonna say off the top of my head mj okay there you go MJ. yeah he's mj mj rodriguez um just um is uh michaela j uh mj rodriguez is in pose and they she uh born male um is uh is just a, a an amazing light you know Amazing. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Totally. Fantastic. Where, where, if you could, if you could be from anywhere else in the world, if you could pick, you know, to, to be from anywhere in the world, or living anywhere in the world, where would it be? Uh, if I, I, if, if I could. And I ask you that because you're someone who's so community oriented. You talk, you, you do things about your neighborhood, your people and all the rest of it. I'm just curious if you were so I else. have this fantasy. So first of all, that's a really big question. And coming from you, it's really meta because when I was 12 years old, um, I, I, you know, my adolescence was really tough because I did not see anybody that was a role model that I wanted to be like kind of Irene Cara, definitely. But, um, but Mick Jagger, there was something about Mick Jagger that, you know, and, and the glam rockers, but Mick was the epitome of someone who was intelligent, business savvy, sexy as fuck, but not beautiful, but, but, but a powerful and, and irreverent, right? Like there was something, and what was really painful was that I knew from my guts that I could never be Mick Jagger. That Mick, like that was like, that my proximity to that world was impossible at, at, at 12, in, inconceivable, you know? I remember having like, a, yeah, I know we were gonna go over time, but, um, but so, so I wanted to be from England and I used to tell people that I was from England and because I didn't, you 
you know, I'm like a Panamanian kid, right? And I'm like 12. They were like, where are you from? And I'd say middle sex because I like the word sex. <laughs> and they were like, this child thinks she's from middle sex. She really thinks she's going to try and tell us she's from middle sex, right? So I was really disturbed. And so that's why I support mental health. Anything is possible. I'm actually from Eight Mile in Detroit. I just thought that having a good English accent would help me on American reality television. And uh, look what and it's done right. for me. <laughs> so there you go, people. Don't believe everything you hear. This is a podcast after all. But then and the, answer, the answer to your question on another level is somewhere in Italy. I'm going to say Tuscany. I've never been to Tuscany, but I see pictures of Tuscany or Sardinia or like, you know, parts of Greece where like the olive trees are and i'm like if i had a goat an mm -hmm. olive tree and some tomato vines i wouldn't leave you know i wouldn't leave i'd just make goat cheese all day definitely we can do that right here let's go make goat cheese that's there you go people we're gonna go make goat cheese but before we do that I've got one final question for you shaken or stirred <laughs> shaken shake it baby Shake it, shake it. Daphne Rubin I mean, Vega. Yeah. I love it. I love you. Thank you so much. You've been such a wonderful guest. You're so full love of light you and love. Your family. It's a pleasure to meet you, Tom. Pleasure to meet you too. I've learned a few new words. There you go. <laughs> go have some invaginating fun. I know. I've been looking it up actually surreptitiously when you went anyway. Yes, it's a good Bas word, isn't it? Lots of bascular. It works yes. like bascular. I didn't even know what the hell. Anyway, there's a whole world out there I didn't even know about. Yeah, no, there's I a whole that. world out there, people, that we none of us know about, but that's what the Shake and the Stirred show is all about. We're going to bring it to you yes. one episode at a time with one fabulous guest at a time. Daphne, thank you so much. Can't wait to see you very soon and have a drink and uh, hang out. All the yes. best. Yes. Much love. Peace see and later. blessings. Bye, bye. Take care, everybody. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you very much for listening. That is Shaken and Stirred. We will be back next week with another podcast and another fantastic guest. And uh, stay safe. See ya.